Hi, everyone. Welcome to the very first episode of 2023. Happy New Year, everybody. This is a little bit different the way I'm doing these intros and outros for the next month. I usually record my intro and outro the day before the episode airs, and then I edit it all together and then, you know, put it up for the world to see and hear. I am currently, for the month of January, in Lake Placid, New York, where Lake Placid is hosting the World University Games, the Winter Games. These are the second largest international winter games next to the Winter Olympics. It's university-aged athletes. And I am Team Canada's chief medical officer. So I am not in my home studio. I am recording this in December 2022. So it's not yet 2023. (laughs) But... I needed to pre-record it because I'm not in my studio. I'm in Lake Placid doing doctoring things. I was also the chief medical officer for the 2021 Winter Games with Team Canada in Lucerne, which were meant to happen, but then were cancelled at the very last minute due to COVID. Now, I 100% agree with this decision, but it was a very gut-wrenching, upsetting, sad time given all the work we had put in, the athletes had put in. But... Those two months of me being very sad of not getting to go to Switzerland and not helping to support Team Canada, I kind of sat around my house, what do I do with my life? Guess what came out of that? This podcast. Hooray! (laughs) So happy 2023, everybody. Um, Hello from Lake Placid, where hopefully I am right now. Hopefully COVID hasn't shut down these games. Oh, I probably just jinxed it. Anyways, happy 2023, everybody. This is going to be an amazing year, and I am kicking it off with one of the most incredible, intense episodes I have had, honestly. My guest this week is Alvin Cohen. Alvin was a football player turned now actor. You may recognize him from television shows such as Westworld and one of my favorites, Better Call Saul. He's from Texas and uh, he played football in Texas. So we talk a lot about not just football culture, but Texas football culture, Texas male toxic masculinity football culture. He then played quarterback for Yale We talk about the football culture there, and then he decided he needed to pursue something creative. There was a drive in him. There was that fire that we all feel as second act actors, and uh, he had headed to L.A., and that's where he's been since, acting and writing. He is an incredibly creative human being, but it's fascinating, again, as a prior athlete myself and someone who works with athletes, to hear the correlations between high elite level sport performance and acting performance. I am so, so excited for you to hear Alvin's story. Please enjoy Alvin Cohen. story how did you get into the acting business that's a good good question and a long story that i'll try to make reasonably short (laughs) um which is um i was a football player growing up i i i played uh, uh, professional football briefly um and when i say briefly i mean very briefly uh and um when i was done i kind of didn't know what i wanted to do and i ran off to eastern europe in this job that I had gotten um, kind of told about and made to sound very glamorous and, you know, hanging out on yachts with Saudi princes and all this stuff. Well, it turned out that that job was not what I thought it was. Um, And I had a girlfriend at the time who was finishing up her master's at USC. And uh, I spent about a year plus in, in Eastern Europe um, in Romania and then Albania um, kind of running a little bit, you know, a little depressed and, and, uh, trying to figure out who I was. If I wasn't playing football, I had dedicated most of my life to playing football. Um, and when I decided that I was done in Eastern Europe or, or when I kind of got ran out of Eastern Europe, which is a whole other story we can get into if you want. But, um, I, I, it was either like go back home to Austin, Texas, where I'm from and, you know, have an insurance job and two kids and a picket fence or, you know, go visit my girlfriend in LA. And 
so I spent 10 days in LA and, um, uh, when I, when I got done, by the time I got done, I decided that I wanted to move out there. And, um, so I came back to Austin, grabbed my stuff and moved to LA. And, uh, two weeks later, she and I broke up. And so I was in LA, not knowing anybody and kind of looked around and was like, well, I guess I'm 24 years old. You know, what do you do when you're 24 years old, single and don't know a soul in LA? Well, you start acting, you know? <laughs> so, um, it was kind of by default. I, I just, I took an acting class just as a way to kind of keep busy really. And, and, um, what I didn't mention was the part of in Eastern Europe where I was doing a little bit of production. So I had a little bit of production experience and, um, kind of, kind of was inter figured I was in LA once and I might as well try out the entertainment industry because if I move somewhere else, I'm probably not going to have the opportunities that I have. And, that was 20 years ago. So <laughs> I ended up, um, yeah, kind of, kind of falling in love with the acting side of the business and that led to writing and producing and podcast production. And, um, so I have my hands in many pots now, but certainly acting is the first and, and, and greatest love. Was there anything that you noticed that you've been able to pull from your, not just professional football career, but just, you know, like life before you got into acting, yeah. Any life skills that you've now noticed? Oh, I'm glad I had that life skill now. Yeah. You know, um, another great question. I, I think, um, there's a lot of similarity in terms of the, the, the supply demand, if you will, in professional sports and acting, right? Like there's an oversupply mm -hmm. of people who want to do it and, and, um, a, a minimal demand for, you know, needs to fill those jobs. I mean, there's 96 professional football quarterbacks approximately, and, you know, half of those positions are already taken by the time you're trying to get in to the game. So in any one year, there's a turnover of 30 guys, maybe that make a roster um, fresh out of college. And there's probably 200 guys that want those jobs. So, it reminds me a little bit of the audition process in the sense that, you know, and especially nowadays with self tapes, you know, I mean, it's a global process and you're competing against hundreds, if not thousands of actors. Of course, we as actors don't like to look at it as competition, you know, and, and I think there's truth to that. It, that's different than football in the sense that, you know, as an actor, it's, um, you know, you, it's your brand and you put out your art and, and sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't. So, I think the parallel there in terms of a mindset has always kind of helped me. Um, I also think that um, football was a very regimented workload. It was, it was very, you know, designed and you had coaches and, you know, you, you, you were, you were in specific places at specific times to do specific activities. And um, it took me a while to apply that model to acting because, you know, acting is a, is a collaborative art. You need, you need, you know, somebody to work with. And, um, so I had a hard time finding out how to kind of work on my own. Um, but eventually, you know, kind of learned and, and, and part of that was honestly writing. And when I started writing, um, I, I learned how to kind of move the ball forward as an actor, um, uh, without, you know, and, and I guess what I'm saying is, put together a schedule that, that, that had me working it at, as a job, you know, as a, as a, as a profession. And I felt like, you know, when you're not on set, that to me is always the hardest time to, to, you know, figure out what you're doing with yourself and how you're, how you're kind of developing and how you're growing as an actor. And class can be helpful in that way, of course. Um, obviously, that's been challenging with the pandemic. But um, uh, I have found that, that that's been the biggest transferable skill has really been understanding, you know, what, what it looks like to, to go after a dream, go after a goal and, and what the kind of workload needs to be to, to try to achieve that goal or, or that dream. And, and it wasn't a direct correlation between football because I had all this support system and had, you know, all this experience, but eventually I was able to kind of collate that experience and then transfer it to like, here's what it would look like as an actor to, you know, work at it as a job. And, and I think that that, to the extent that I've had success, um, you know, a lot of it has been as a result of kind of approaching acting 
as something that needs to be honed every day, a skill that needs to be in my calendar daily, whether that's picking up a monologue, whether that's, you know, a real audition, whether that's self-submitting, whether that's, you know, business, you know, admin type stuff. Um, I have acting time in my schedule every single day. And, and um, honestly, if I didn't, I, I think it, it, it to me feels like the, the, the seed of everything else. It feels like I can't be a writer. I can't be a producer. I can't be a good father. I can't be a good husband if, you know, that part of my soul isn't taken care of. And, and so um, the performance element of it is, is still important to me. It's interesting that you mentioned that kind of regimented and putting it in your in your day be as like that's what you would do if it was your job, yeah. which it is, right? You know, I have a meeting between this time and this time. I'm acting between this time yeah. and this time. It's funny if I chat with people, and this is a broad generalization: people who've been acting for longer, you know, like the kind of people who've been acting all the time, they've kind of countered me saying, oh, well, that takes the creative spontaneity out of, like, that takes the art out of acting and turns it into, like, the science of acting. And then, like, that kind of destroys the beauty of the art and flat. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because I'm of your vein, right? I need the logical segmented, you know, like, regiment. But I kind of worry, like, oh, is that getting rid of the creative spontaneity? It's funny because I read, I read, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm dabbling, as I mentioned, in a lot of different creative professions. And so, you know, writing, for instance, is a very solo pursuit, right? You can write without the help of anybody else. And as a writer, it's the opposite kind of culture, right? Like when you talk to other writers, they're like, you've got to show up at the page and write regardless. Like a prof- the difference between an amateur and a professional is a professional writes every day. Like you, there's all this like hmm. philosophy as writers that is counter to exactly what we hear as actors, which is kind of, I agree. Like a lot of people hear that. Right. And a lot of people believe that. And, um, I think there is room for spontaneity as an actor, but I just don't think that reflects the real world. Like if I book a, you know, multi episode co-star or multi episode guest star or regular, like, do I feel like acting every day? Like, I I don't think so, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and so if I'm just like that, that, that lends itself to me to being the actor who wants to stay in their trailer until they feel ready to be inspired when the whole crew is waiting on you. And, and that's a, a bit of an exaggeration, but it's like, to me, craft is being able to turn on and turn off, you know, your character. And, and, and it, I, I think that at least for me personally, it's a lot easier to ramp up than it is to ramp down. So I actually struggle with the opposite effect, which is more of a depression or a, uh, a letting go of the character. Once I'm done in that particular, like I put so much energy and effort into that, into that, that work. And then to let it go, I actually struggle with that. And, you know, my wife would tell you, I'm kind of a crazy nut after I get off the set. (laughs) Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I hear that and I think it would be nice to me if I could act only when I'm inspired to act or it, it, I could wait for inspiration. I just don't think that reflects my life in the business. I, I, I think auditions come when they come, jobs come when they come. And, you know, I, I don't think that my output would be, at least for me, my output would not be regular or good. (laughs) Um, just because I wouldn't be practicing the craft very often. I would, you know, I'd be waiting for inspiration most of the time. And, and, um, I, I, it's nice when that, when those connect, those do connect occasionally when you're inspired or you get a part that, you know, really reflects your brand or you're very interested in, or, you know, there's a part of it that, that you really connect to and you can really dive in there deep. Um, and, and that, that to me is the drug, right? Like that's what we're all seeking, um, is that connection of inspiration and art. Um, but I don't know that, (laughs) I mean, you know, that happens 
to me, at least for me, 30 or 40% of the time. And the other time, you know, I'm running a business and for me to run a business, I, I have to approach it as a regular, you know, I've got to, I've got to be there every day and show up and work on my business. And, you know, I will admit that Mm -hmm. sometimes that, um, looks different, you know, sometimes I'll have like a audition on the books and I'm just not feeling it. So I'll go do some admin instead and, or I'll, you know, open up something. I, I, you know, I have a lot of different ways that kind of warm me up to kind of get into something. I don't think that when I show up to be an actor, when I show up to be a writer, like I'm, I'm rarely ever in the mood to do those things. And like, for me as a writer, like the first step is, um, listening to a song and, and like, I, there's certain songs that I associate with the scripts. Right. And so I listen to that song and I open the script and I just, I agree to myself. My commitment to myself is I'm going to read the last scene I wrote. Like, that's it. That's the only agreement. Right. And so I'm listening to a song and I'm reading the script and the next thing, you know, ideas start to flow and, and there's, Next thing you know, I'm writing a paragraph and a page and, and, and I see it the same way as an actor. It's like, um, all I have to do is pick up the script, right? Like I just have to pick it up and I have to read it. And that's to me is like the first step is like a little bit of music, maybe a, maybe a a scent is really big for me. So I like, I like to, you know, light a candle or burn some sage or something. And there's something about that that gets me in the artist inspiration phase. And so I, I, have a scent and I pick up the script and I read the script and that's all I'm agreeing to do to myself. Like I've got this time in my schedule, but I'm only agreeing to that. And, um, yeah, usually by the time, you know, I picked up the script and, and, you know, that song is over, I'm interested in doing a little bit more work. And, and, um, so again, like to me, I think craft is that ability, right? It's, it's that ability to kind of, turn yourself on and and then like i said on the back side be able to turn it off which again i struggle with much more than the the turning on part were you always creative growing up like were you a creative kid it was such a latent interest in that like i was always a kid who liked art like i was i was always a kid who was drawing who was building with legos you know who was out playing imaginary you know stuff with friends building in the woods and running around and pretending like you're a cowboys and Indians or whatever it was, you know? And so I had a very, um, I think a very creative brain and a very, um, fulfilled imaginary life. (laughs) Um, but I think that the culture of sports and the, and, and certainly the culture of, you know, Texas masculinity, if you will, kind of dampened that. And, and certainly the football culture that I grew up in, you know, that was kind of at least the way I felt. And I don't know that this is actually true or whether it was just how I felt about it, but there was kind of like a, a look down of like, that's for sissies kind of thing, you know? Um, and, and, and so, you know, I, I, I never got to like, it was always something like even I, I went to Yale um, for for college and um, you know very obviously prestigious acting program and I remember I was playing football in college at, at Yale and I remember kind of walking around campus and always passing by the drama department and knowing that there were famous people who had come out of that drama department and kind of like looking around but never really being able to say yeah I want to go in there and check that out you know because like one of my good friends. He joined. He was on the football team with us at Yale, and he he went and auditioned for the, the one of the plays that the drama department was. And he and he ended up, you know, they needed bodies because they only had a certain amount of students, and so he ended up in like the ensemble, like being like a soldier who carried a spear in some play, you know, like no lines, like an extra. And and the first day that the the production went up in New Haven, like. 30 football players showed up and sat in the front row. And when he came up on stage, they pointed and laughed at him. And that you like, you oh know, as an God. actor, like that's awful, right? Like that would be awful, but that was just, that's the culture of football. Right. And I'm not saying it's useful. I am saying it's useful in producing football players, but it's not useful in, you know, so many other ways. Uh, and, and, and so, 
just to tell that story like that, that was kind of my experience growing up as a, as somebody who had a latent creative curiosity and, and wasn't really allowed to express that so much so that my first acting teacher told me that I had armor on that I had to take off to be an artist. And I think it took me five to 10 years to really kind of be comfortable in, you know, expressing that way, even to this day, you know, I'm no different than anybody else. I'll, 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 you know, put something out on the internet or whatever. And, and, you know, as an actor and I'll do a monologue and I'll put, put it on Twitter or whatever. And, you know, I'm, st- I still have a little bit of that, like uh, the football player is going to be on the front row laughing at me kind of thing, you know? So um, long winded answer, but, but mm-hmm. all to say, yes, it's always been who I am, but I think I've only really stepped into that skin and that voice within the last five or 10 years. <laughs> Mm. And what's been helpful kind of stepping into that and kind of getting rid of the term I've heard is emotional restraint, that kind of hardened shell. And what's been helpful for you? Mm. That's, um, I, I think if you talk to, to my acting teachers and, 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 you know, mentors over the years, I'm still, um, a restrained actor. I, I, my, my emotions are, are still bubbling underneath. I'm not going to be, you know, the, the Jim Carrey big actor, right? Like I'm always going to be a little more subtle. Um, and I think part of that is that shell that, that still exists. It's part of who I am. And I think accepting that that's part of who I am as an actor is, is, has been useful. Um, I think, again, I, I go back to the, the conversation we were having about discipline, which is just knocking at the door every single day to try to open that process up. Um, uh, and that, that looks like practice. That looks like getting on stage and failing. You know, That looks like having a teacher who is actually pushing you healthily and um, you know, to, to go further, to go deeper. My most recent teacher who I adored um, and unfortunately recently passed away – um, she opened up Shakespeare to me and, and like, I had never done Shakespeare. I wasn't, you know, I, I was playing football, so I wasn't classically trained or, you know, and, and that always felt like this way over there thing, you know, like this thing that, you know, actors who went to drama school and, you know, did, and, you know, she made it accessible to me. And, and I think more than anything, it, it, like that's an experience that grew me emotionally or, or opened me up emotionally as an actor, just the challenge of, you know, that language and that level of, you know, work was, um, it forced a, a, yeah, a growth. Um, and then I also think for me, self-care has been huge. Um, you know, I, I, I meditate regularly. I, um, I have a pretty good, you know, diet and exercise routine. Um, all of those things to feel comfortable in your own skin, to be able to put on, you know, that, that actor opening or, you know, being able to, to, to fully expose yourself. I I think you have to be comfortable in in your own skin. And I consider that just as much a part of the routine of an actor as, as, you know, learning lines or, or studying a part or, you know, putting a play up or doing an audition. Like I, I just think without that balance of, you know, figuring out ways to take care of your, your mind and your soul and your body. Like, um, it, it, a, I don't think you show up fully because you're withholding something or, you know, and B, I, I, I think it's, um, terribly challenging on your mental health. <laughs> Was there a time, I know you said, you know, your transition from being in Europe now to LA, you know, what else do you do, but be in LA and be an actor. But w- besides like, now your situation has changed. Was there anything else that you noticed at that time was kind of the kind of click on that said, okay, I'm, I'm not going to be a pro football player. I'm going to kind of step out of this like Texas masculinity and embrace my more creative side. Was there anything that you noticed? Like what caused that? Uh, I've never thought of that. Um, What caused that? I think that, (laughs) I've never thought of this, but, but I think the, my answer to that question would be being alone. Um, and, and, um, really feeling kind of rock bottom after that breakup. And, you know, the combination over that 18 months of, 
of of you know losing a, uh, my first dream, my dream of pro football, kind of falling back and trying to figure myself out, and then losing a girlfriend and and you know really being alone in this massive city. Um, I think that cause like that would be one of the areas where I say like that that was a rock bottom for me and it caused a a, a renaissance of a, a, a transformation in the sense that like who do like i don't really have anything much that i'm excited about or passionate about or you know forward thinking you know what i want to achieve or goals or anything like that i was just kind of wandering and and a bit lost and of course, LA is a great place to be lost, but um, uh, I think when you're at that place, you know, you start asking questions of like, what do I want? You know, like, who do I want to be? Um, and, and I had some fortunate, um, you know, people come into my life at that time, some mentors. Um, I joined an acting class that really felt like a community. I found some friends there um, and and people who were just starting out as well or didn't have a ton of experience. And we had this kind of um, one of those acting teachers that's a little, you know, kind of, you know, strict and, you know, kind of, you know, you'd show up and, you know, if your scene sucked, she'd let you know that it sucked. Um, And, and so, and so there was this merry band of us that were, it was like us versus the teacher in some ways, you know? And so, um, I think finding that community where it was safe to like, because again, like her teaching style mimicked football coaches. Mm. So it was, it, it, so it was the combination of kind of like hitting that rock bottom and thinking, what do I want? And then finding out, Oh, there's other people here that, that, that like this too. I'm not this weird Texas feminine guy that likes, you know, likes, likes to act, right? Like it, it, it became, that was a permission for me to start to express, I think, and, and start to go down the path. And again, I, I think that path was a long road. <laughs> um, it was not overnight for me. Um, I, I, especially in that environment, um, you know, with a strict teacher, um, there was a lot of, a lot of questioning and a lot of frustration over those next few years. But, um, yeah, I, I think, I think that that's, it was really a, a, yeah, a, 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 a really a reshifting of identity, um, on a core level and, and finding out more about, like I said, I think that bass note was always there. It just wasn't allowed. It was a voice inside of me that was always kind of whispering, but was never allowed to be heard. And, and I think that the, the, the rock bottom and the mentors and the community allowed me to say, Hey, it's okay to let this voice out. And, um, that was a process, but, but one that I think in some ways, like really, I I don't mean to like dramatize it, but really saved me. You know, I mean, I, I, I needed I think that that voice would have eaten at me um, had I gone into a corporate job. I think I always, you know, I would have had huge regrets. I, I might have um, drank a lot more, you know, like I, I, um, I, I think it would have just gnawed inside. And, and fortunately um, for, for me, I, I somehow found a way to, you know, let it out. Is there anything that has surprised you? about the entertainment industry since being in it? it yes. Um, and it's kind of the same thing on both the positive and negative side, um, which is like how, how wonderful people can be like how, um, how collaborative, like what great things can be made. Um, I did a, I did a, a little part on Westworld, the massiveness of that production was just awe inspiring, you know, like I've been on some, some pretty big sets. um, Yeah, that doesn't matter, but, but the, the, and I don't name drop Westworld other than to say like 
it was a massive production. I mean, there were three different crews and different locations and I mean, all the bells and whistles, you know, the, the cranes and the lightings and the, you know, and, um, seeing the, the, you know, the full, the full scale of what's possible and, 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 and feeling like you're a part of something that, that is really meaningful and, and people enjoy or gives people something to think about or, um, uh, uh, you know, causes them to emote in some way. Um, I, I don't know. There's a contribution there element there that I think is, um, really important for me as an actor to feel like there's meaning within what I'm doing. And, and, um, I think that when I enjoy acting the most, it's, it's when I feel like I'm contributing to a conversation or, or, you know, causing, um, reaction in, in an audience. Um, and so just seeing, a group of people come together on a massive scale to produce something with the intention of contributing or, or giving a gift to an audience. And that can be in a black box theater of 90 people. It can also be on a massive Westworld set, but that, that always keeps me in awe and kind of makes me feel like a little kid of like, I can't believe we get to do this. Like you see this, like we like look around, like look at what we're doing. Like, and and I just, I get yoked up on that. Like that, that to me has always, it always surprises me. Um, and on the negative side, you know, people can be assholes. <laughs> um, and I think that just because you're famous or just because you're making a lot of money that gives you a right, you know, to, to denigrate another human, you know? So, um, and that happens in this business, you know, people are hyped up on their power. I, I, I call, um, somebody a long time ago told me that Hollywood is just high school with money. And, and I, I think that's true. It's like these little clicks and bands of, you know, here's the geeks over here. Here's the comedians over here. Here's the rich kid, you know, like, and it's true. It, and, and, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, that's the part of it that has continued to surprise me that, you know, and there are, I think that is massively overstated. I think that most of the people that I have been fortunate to work with, whether famous or not, have been really, really quality human beings, but, you know, and, and I think people like to publicize the bad apples uh, because they're fun to talk about. Right. And it's drama and it's, it fills the newspapers when, you know, somebody goes off on their crew tree for whatever, you know, like, um, but, but, um, I have found on, on a vast majority scale that, that most people working in the entertainment industry are hugely collaborative, helpful, grateful, loving people. Um, so I guess that always surprises me when you run across somebody who's an asshole. <laughs> Yeah, I had that conversation with someone just recently as well, too. And, you know, you could wax poetic about, like, why does it happen? When does it happen? Like, when do these really nice people turn into assholes? Like, what's the level of money, right? But this industry, even though there are tons of people wanting to do it, it is still so tiny and small. And so as soon as you kind of, the word gets out that you're, you know, not fun to work with, I don't know. I just don't see why is there an why I, I don't know there's no end game what's the end game there if you're an asshole i don't get it we hear about the people who are assholes who are famous right and and i think you know you don't hear about the people who are assholes who aren't famous and i think that's because they don't have the leverage to be an asshole and so people don't work with them right like it, it, if you show up and you're a problem and you're not you don't have the the like i said the leverage to be a problem, then like people are just gonna be like, well, I won't work with you anymore. You know, I feel like we only hear about celebrity assholes because they're the only people that can kind of get away with it. And, 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 you know, I have some empathy for that, I guess, because fame is a fickle thing. And, and, um, I think it does something to your brain, you know, I, I'm in football in, um, in acting, you know, I've, I've worked with known, you know, famous people and, and that's a weird thing, man. Like I, 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 you know, 
that level of attention, that level of, of, uh, I mean, people that, you know, names that you would know have told me stories about the experience of fame that, that would make your skin crawl. And people handle that differently, you know, like their values and their makeup. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that it's okay that they be assholes to people on sets and, and, and around them. I, I'm because I don't think that's okay. But I think until you've stepped in somebody's shoes, that's famous, that has to deal with like, I, I won't, I won't tell his name, but I, I have a, I have a friend who's, who's um, the brother of, of, of a very famous actor, somebody that everybody knows. And um, you know, he's, he's, he's separated from the family and, and to some degree. And, um, again, I'm friends with a brother of a very famous football player also kind of separated from the family to some degree. And, and I've, and, and there's a lot of parallels there between the football and the, and the actor. And, and, um, it, what's really interesting about that to me is like, I just don't think the family understands what their lives are like. And, and, and so there's this disconnect between, you know, the day to day of a famous actor and what they have to deal with that is just not relatable for, for their family, a normal person, you know, how do you, the way that that person walks through the world, um, is different and, 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 um, that fame comes with a a cost. And I, I think you know, again, no empathy for being an asshole. And I honestly, no empathy for fame. I think we would, you know, we're all to some degree chasing that and and wouldn't mind being at that level of success. I, I don't mean to denigrate that, but, um, I do think that, you know, um, it's a burden to some people. And, and I think that carrying that, it, you know, people just don't understand what that day to day is like. Um, so, you know, there is a little bit of empathy on my side for when they lose control. Um, because I, I think, I think the pressure of that is a lot. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're hundred percent correct. And I was just thinking about, I think there's a reason why actors, well, and other just famous people marry famous people or partner up with famous yeah. people because nobody really, nobody else could understand what they're going through on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. And it would be difficult. And it, yeah, it's not just like partnering romantically, it's partnering friends, you know, like how do you trust someone who literally can only sympathize? They can't empathize with you. And I think it, it, it it's everywhere in every industry, right? I think about like, I'm in medicine. Yeah. Most doctors marry other doctors. Yeah. It's like, yeah, nobody understands what it's like, right? It's super dramatic, <laughs> but it's yeah. part of it. It's part of who you are in your life. I mean, wouldn't you just love to be a fly on the wall when like Brad Pitt, George Clooney and Julia Roberts are, are in their trailer, you know, like I would just love to know what's that conversation, you know? I mean, those are the only people in the world who understand what the other person is, you know? And so I would just love to know what they're talking about, you know, like, and, and, and it's a good point. It's a really good point. Like I, I, Again, don't condone them being assholes about anything, but I, I also think that um, w- very little, very few people in the world know what, know what that's like. Do you have any advice for people wanting to s- either switch careers into acting or, again, not just acting, everything you're doing, writing, producing, just trying to be more creative from a life that wasn't as creative? Well, <laughs> I don't know that I feel like I should be giving anybody advice on anything. Um, Hello, I've had two lines in a Hallmark movie. What am I doing with an acting podcast? I'll give it my best effort, but to all of your listeners, please, please take it with a grain of salt because I'm just an idiot on the internet. Looking back over all the experiences, if I had it to do all over again, I, I think the biggest thing I would have done is is take care of the money aspect of my professional life before in the start before creative. And and what I mean by that is I think it's a lot to put pressure on your art to provide for your life. Um, I I think it, I think it hurts your art, especially early on when you're first kind of starting and you're, you know, fumbling and failing. And, you know, I, 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 I was one of these people that, you know, 
moved to LA and was like, well, I'm going to be a big star. I don't need another job, you know? And, and here I was three years into it and barely paying rent and, you know, um, kind of that pressure of survival level, you know, base needs being met, I I think is a lot to put on your art early on. And so uh, uh, to me, if I had to do all over again, I would have found a job that allowed me to, to pursue it, you know, but would have taken care of my basic needs so that I wasn't putting pressure on an audition or on a job to, you know, pay me enough money to pay my rent or put food in my belly that month. I, I, I think those first few years, I would have just given myself the space to say, hey, this is the side thing right now. This is the thing that puts food on my table. And, you know, I'm going to learn how to do this. Um, and and so I, I wish I had... I wish I had, um, I, I, I feel like we as artists, especially as actors feel this like pressure to, at least I did to like make it, um, which I don't even know what that means. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I wish I hadn't put that pressure on my art because I felt like it was detrimental to my art. Um, and, and it was only really when I stabilized financially that, that, um, you know, I was able to really, what we were talking about earlier, take risks and, and open up to, you know, the creative energy, um, and really expose myself because I didn't feel like I had to, I had to get this job to be able to pay for my life. Um, and, and the other thing I would say, again, an idiot on the internet giving advice, but, um, is like, um, dabbling in the, in the, in, in the, in the different fields and having it. I mean, I, I, I expect that that's pretty common advice, but like the writing has informed my acting, the producing has informed my acting, like, um, you know, the packaging of projects has, has informed my acting. Um, you know, just having a tacit understanding of, of what all of those other people are doing, um, and the pressures that they understand or that they're feeling, or, I mean, sometimes I'll get a script and honestly, it's pretty bad. (laughs) And, and yet I know what that's like as a writer, right? Like I know what it's like to sit in front of that computer screen with a blank page and try to produce something. And so there's a, there's a, as an actor, as I sit in front of that script and I look at it, I'm like, this was somebody trying, man. Like you need to show up for them and make it beautiful for them because this is their art and your in service of that script. And, um, even if you don't, you know, let go of your misconceptions, like that to me, like as a writer has like, yeah, like informed me as an actor where there's just a level of, of preciousness or a level of, um, love that you have to bring to your work as an, as an actor in service to what that other person is bringing. And, and, I just don't think I knew that inside out until I sat in front of a blank page for two hours and wrote some really bad text and, you know, had looked at it and was like, Oh, this is hard. (laughs) Um, and, and, um, so I I just think that like exploring where, you know, we talked about inspiration, exploring where, where you're inspired in, 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 you know, I have found that, when acting is slow, writing is, is, is fast. When, when writing and acting are slow, Mm -hmm. producing is fast. When, you know, producing and writing are slow, acting is fast. So I have found that the the diversity of skill sets has kept me more busy creatively. And to the end of what I said at the beginning, which is it's allowed me to transition out of that hobby phase and make creativity as a whole, my profession, because, I don't make just, I don't make enough money to, to, to make a living just as an actor, just as a writer, just as a producer, but you combine all of those things and I make a pretty good living. Um, as I said, acting is still the source. It's still the seed, but, um, it's allowed me to not have to have that other job because I've diversified the skill sets professionally enough to live in creativity. And I, again, that inspires that, that fuels, um, you know, at least I'll be working on a a podcast as a, as a producer or something. And, and, um, you know, I'm dabbling in script and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at storyline and, um, 
you know, that inspires me. At least I'm in creative work day to day, all day, as opposed to the separation, which was how I started and how I think people should start. But, uh, you know, I'm not over here. I don't know, being a personal trainer or having to work at a restaurant or, you know, you name it. And, and, uh, you know, the creativity is this small box that I get to open occasionally. It's like day to day is all creative now. And that's because there's a multiple skill sets that, that I can, that I've monetized so that I've got different streams of income coming in as the, as the inevitable ups and downs of the business, you know, come. That's great advice. And I, again, just kind of going back to what we were talking about before, about why do actors become assholes and that whole empathizing with who's going to empathize with these people. It's the same thing with now, you know, exactly how it feels to be in the shoes of a writer, right? So what an advantage, well, not advantage, because like, everyone can do it, but no, not that many people do it, right? But yeah, like what, like, that's so good, like you were saying for your acting, because now you have not just sympathy for like, oh, yeah, sorry, (laughs) your script is bad. It's empathy, right? And that is such a key emotion for actors. And it's not coming from like, I learned how to be empathetic. It's in acting class. It's really empathetic. You know, you know where else I've seen it show up? as well is in the audition process, there's been a shift in in my head that I think has come from being a writer. And you'll hear a lot of actors be like, Oh, go do, go be the reader for a casting office or go, you know, intern at a casting office and you'll learn what it looks like. And it's like, yeah, that's great. And, and I'm sure that helps some people. It didn't help me. I did it. (laughs) Um, all I saw was, you know, the ego in me saying, well, I should walk in and audition for this part. <laughs> and the truth is I probably, the truth is I probably wouldn't have been any better or any worse than any of the people that we saw. But um, I think one of the things that has really shifted in me is to, is in, in that regard is to see like, if you talk to writers, if you talk to showrunners, if you talk to, 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 they are again, mass generalization. Um, but by and whole introverts, right? Somebody who's able to sit in a room all day looking at a computer, living in an imaginary world in their own head, that takes a certain type of person. And so all they want is the actor to come into that audition and beautify what they've written or bring to life what they've written. And for me personally, that knowledge has allowed me to show up and give my art in an audition the way that I see it without fear of, you know, rejection or booking a part. Like I may not be, you know, the flavor of coffee that they're looking for that day, but for me, it's given me permission to say, I'm going to like this guy seems quirky and like, I'm kind of quirky. Like I'm going to, you know, I'm going to influence this in a different way. And I'm going to like, maybe I'll do something interesting. And some of, some of the people that see that appreciate that. And some of the people, you know, that see that like book me and some of the people that see that say, I'm not right for that part. But I think that is what success as an actor looks like to me is showing up and bringing your full art to the table. And I think that knowing what writers, writers just their heart sings when they see an actor on tape or in, you know, like that level of when they bring, when they're like, Oh, they, they, that's it, you know? And, and I think that knowledge has, has given me permission in auditions to play. Um, and, and I, I now feel like, you know, to me, the audition process is when you can start making little short films that are for you and kind of private for you and like your eyes only, you know, when you show up and you, you, you have somebody that maybe is a reader that you've trust and like, you guys are making a little short film and it's like, don't care whether anybody sees this, like the, the process, you know, people talk about the process. What does that mean? Like, for me, the way that I've reinterpreted that is I'm making a short film for me and like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make this little short film and I'm going to send it off, you know? And, and, but like, I like it. Like at the end of the day, when I look at it and I watch it, am I like, yeah, 
I like that, you know? And if I can get to that place, like, yeah, that, that's good. Like, I'm good with that. Like, I don't care what happens, like, because I don't control that. But, like, when I make this little short film and I watch it and it kind of makes me chuckle or, you know, makes me afraid or makes me smile or whatever, you know, like, that to me is auditioning. And, and, and that to me is success in auditioning when it makes me happy, you know, and makes me proud or fulfilled or emote or it affects me. Um, yeah. So long winded answer, but to say writers, you know, the writing process has taught me that, that I just, when I write, I just want an actor to come in and knock it out of the freaking park. You know, like I, I want to see them bring them and, and bring something that I didn't even think of and wow me. And the way that that again has influenced as an actor is to say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do what makes me kind of, you know, excited. <laughs> and so I, I love that, that one gives you the control back in this industry that we have no control. Right. But two, for some weird reason, and I don't know why actors have this, it's that feeling that everyone is the antagonist against them. Casting, writing, producing, directing. Probably because it's like, we book so few of the auditions that we get. But I love that in the fact that, how would you know that it's the exact opposite? Casting, writing, producing, directing... They all want you to be the part. They're excited. They're like, yes, please be this person. We're so excited for you to see to, you to work your magic. How else would you know that that's actually how people are feeling if you're not that person, if you've never been in that position? I love that. That's, I'm so like inspired by that. That's exciting. We, we, just get, we just get so little feedback, you know? I mean, yeah. we see these tapes off and we don't hear anything, you know? And and. And so, um, not affiliated, no, 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 no benefit to me, but there's a guy named Michael Kostroff and he runs this class called audition psych One Hundred and One, um, which I took and is all about the psychology of auditioning. Um, mm. he has a bit of a mantra that he, he says helps him, um, which is, um, I'm not going to get this job or I'm not going to book this job or whatever. And so he, he says that idea of like releasing the need to book the job allows him to come and show up fully and play with the job. Um, I really, really recommend his class, but um, for me, it's a little bit of a, a, a twist on that in the sense that like, I think I have to fulfill me um, before I can worry about anything else. And, and to me, um, just making art is in, in putting it out there is success as an artist. Like I don't control the rest, you know? And, and, um, like you said, and, and, and casting directors and, you know, you, you go to workshops or producers, writers, whatever, they all say that they're all like, yeah, we're just looking for you to come in and knock it out. Like we're your teammate. And you're like, yeah, but then you don't give me any feedback when I don't like, are you really on my team? You know, like, and so it's this, we hear that. And yet as actors, I, I know how I felt was like, yeah, I don't believe that. Like, I, I, I think, I, I think that you, you probably feel that way. You are looking for that part and you probably feel like you're on my team, but the fact is you don't have the time or energy to act like a partner on my team. So you know, the feeling as an actor is that person isn't on my side. And, and, and like you said, you feel like you're, you know, this dancing bear, um, you know, that's supposed to come in and dance for all these people and then hope they like your dance. And it's like, I think, I think a, a, a lot of it is about, like you said, like finding a way to make it work for you. And, and for me, that has been, I'm here on this earth for a certain period of time and, and I want, I, I need to express what's inside me. And I think going all the way back to that transition and that dark moment, that was really the decision. The really the decision was I can't hide this anymore. This person, this person has to be expressed and, and it's taken me a long time to do that in a skilled way, but that's what auditioning has become is just an opportunity for me to show up and create art that makes me 
feel expressed and fulfilled. And, and, um, I've seen much better results <laughs> professionally as a result of that. Do you have any memorable or favorite on set stories? Uh, sure. Um, couple name drops in there, so, which I hate, but, um, Go for uh, it. <laughs> uh, I, I booked a, a small part on that Bradley Cooper film, American Sniper that Clint Eastwood directed. And, um, uh, it was ultimately cut from the film. Um, but two, two stories there, it was, it was, you know, five lines, right. Um, uh, so not a huge part, but a huge production. Um, and I mean, you know, I'd be an extra on a Clint Eastwood film. So <laughs> like, I, um, so two things that were kind of interesting there. One, one, one was I, I did my scene. I was, you know, kind of in awe of everything, maybe a little too excitable. Um, but you know, I, Clint Eastwood's a legend and like, he's, if, you know, outside of Paul Newman is probably my favorite of all time. So I wanted to say hello and like, thank him, you know, just, I, I had been up for a much bigger part that they ultimately gave to the real person in the, the real Navy SEAL who had done that. And, and so I think this was kind of a little, Hey, you didn't get the big part, but you know, let's bring you on the film and, you know, make your day kind of thing. And, and, um, so I, I just wanted to see Clint Eastwood and say, thanks, you know, well, he went to his bus and was there for like two hours. So here I am like done with my work day hanging out. And I think all the PAs and the producers were kind of like, get this guy out of here, you know? <laughs> um, but they were, they were cordial and he finally came out and, and I went up to him and, you know, it was just one of those Hollywood moments where it's like, you're talking to Franklin Eastwood, you know? And I said, you know, Mr. Eastwood, just want to thank you, man. That was really great. And it just stuck in my mind because he, 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 he turned on that little Eastwood voice, you know, Dirty Harry. And he was just like, yeah, it was a great scene. And like that just made my, 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 my life, you know, like as an actor, like Clint Eastwood told me it was a great scene. All four of my lines, man, you know, I'm I, like, yes, I could live on that for a while. And, you know, I'll tell you this, it, it, talking about good people in the industry, you know, little known thing you know, that scene got cut, right. And, and it got cut for a number of reasons, most of which I think were story and totally get it. But I got a letter from Robert Lorenz and Eastwood himself before the film came out, just saying, Hey, just wanted you to have a heads up that the, the, the scene was cut. I'm sorry. We really appreciated your work and all of that. And signed by them. And I, you know, I got that framed, um, in my house and, you know, it's it, like, you wonder who is, who is Robert Lorenz, who is Clint Eastwood? Like, why have they been so successful? It's that stuff. Right. And, and people don't know that, like, that's my little, like that meant the world to me that I'm not out telling everybody to go watch American Sniper and look for me, you know, even in my two lines, like, you know, it saved me some, some promotional embarrassment and also just a good solid like thing to do to an actor, like an understanding of what's important to an actor. And like, he didn't have to do that, you know, like most people don't. Right. I mean, most people who, 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 when they get cut out of something, they find out when they, when it shows up. Um, so I just think like, that's an, ex going back to what we were talking about, just being good to people. Like it, it's, it, it surprises me not that Clint Eastwood has had the career he's had. If his, his care and attention to a four line co-star level actor on a scene that got cut out is any indication of who he is as a person, then, you know, it's not surprising that he's a legend and had all the success that he's had because when you treat people that way, you know, it comes back and it, and it benefits you and people want to work with you. I mean, it, I'd, I'd work with him just because of Clint Eastwood, but on, on top of that, like, you know, like the way he treated me when, when he didn't have to, he just reflects who he is and, and you want to be around that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's wonderful. Do you have anything that you are looking forward to coming up this year? Yeah. Um, I have, 
a pretty big guest star that I have to say the extremely arrogant and uh, annoying thing of that I can't talk about much because I did I did sign an NDA, but it's in the last couple episodes of Better Call Saul, um, which are airing now. Um, and I'm in, uh, I think, the second to last episode with a pretty big guest star um, spoiler part. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that because it's um, in the world of Better Call Saul, which I think is a great television show. And, and um, Vince Gilligan directed my episode. Um, uh, so it's a big episode for them and their world. And, and I'm a big, apparently, a big part of it. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I'm really excited about that. Um, and, and then I've got a, a big podcast that I produce that's, that's coming out, um, sometime in October called something in the water. That's about concentrations of highly successful athletes from a given location. And, um, the athletic is involved in that. And so it'll be a big to do on the podcast world. Um, so I'm excited about that. That sounds awesome. I work in sports medicine, anything sports. I'm like, Oh, fun <laughs> i will check that out for sure it's it's a really i think an interesting idea in the sense that like it's almost like a socialization look at sports as opposed to like like you know a, a sports podcast it's almost like something you'd hear like from freakonomics except it has a sports tint to it so it's kind of looking at why these people who all were uber successful came from you know this area so we have this small town in minnesota that has produced an inordinate amount of nhl hockey players and um you know like dominican republic baseball players and um you know because of the access through the athletic we've gotten to talk to some pretty cool people i mean on the we're doing an episode on women's uh soccer that we got uh, that's around New Jersey, we got to talk to like a couple of U.S. women's national team players, a couple of pretty famous coaches. That episode is crazy mind blowing for for like why um, why the women's soccer showed up in New Jersey. It's like all these you know immigration factors and you know kind of they, all these different factors came together to kind of produce this little hotbed of soccer talent that produced an inordinate amount of women's national soccer team players. So. Um, it's a cool, it's a cool podcast and, and I'm really excited about it. Really proud of it. Um, um, and excited for people to hear that and see what people think. <laughs> Do you have any final words of wisdom or words of advice? That's such a loaded question. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I told you I'm just an idiot on the internet, so I don't know, what, yeah, right. uh, anybody, <laughs> I don't feel I don't feel I should be giving anybody any advice on really anything. Um, but, um, this has been a lot of fun and, and it's, it's, um, it's just great to talk acting, you know, and nerd out on, on, you know, acting. Cause I, I, I yeah, I, I think that, like I said, it's just, it's the seed of everything. And so, you, you know, when you talk about where do you get inspired, I get inspired by being around actors and, and act, getting to act and getting to, you know, be on sets and, um, do it professionally. It, 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 um, it, it is the fuel for all of my creative endeavors. So, um, thanks for the opportunity to, to chat acting. Cause, um, at least for today, I'll be all up. <laughs> I'll probably go make an Instagram story with me air guitar or something, which is usually what I do when I'm inspired. So yeah. This is a good yeah. day. Yeah. I feel the same way. Yeah. yeah I feel the same way. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and thank you, Alvin, for being my guest this week. Thank you for being the guest that kicks off 2023. I knew that there was no story better to kick off a new year than yours. It is absolutely incredible. I'm so excited for your career so far and where the career is going. Thank you so much for sharing your story and advice and inspiration with me and with all of my listeners. Oh, I appreciate you so much. Thank you everyone for tuning in and I hope you'll join me next week for another episode of Second Act Actors. Bye! Second Act Actors is produced and edited by me, Janet McMorty. Theme music by Guillaume. Additional sound editing by David Studio. Additional video editing by Jackie Wadewer. Show notes written by Sarah Hopkinson. I record using Riverside FM. If you're interested in developing an interview-based webcast like mine, I highly recommend this platform. 
Shoot me an email and I'll direct you to the wonderful folks there. If you or someone you know is interested in being a guest, email me at secondactactors at gmail.com. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. My love language is words of affirmation, so compliments, constructive criticism, and feedback are always welcome and encouraged. Negative Nancys, Judgy McJudgersons, or Debbie Downers, unless you're Rachel Dratch, regarding me or my guests are not welcome. It takes serious courage to share your story with the world, so if you're tempted to negatively comment about someone else's story, please ask your therapist why you're such a garbage person. Save the drama for the stage. On that happy note, I hope you'll tune in next week for another episode of Second Act Actors. Bye!